Again, it's Memorial Day weekend. Tomorrow is a day about remembering. Uh, the topic for this morning is remembering. And so I thought it'd be a great idea if we start with a Memorial Day trivia quiz called, What Do You Remember About Memorial Day? Okay, I encourage you to compete with those seated next to you, but the use of smartphones during this quiz is strictly prohibited. So put the phones away. That would be cheating. But we're just going to do a Memorial Day quiz and just see what you know about it, what you remember about Memorial Day, okay? So um, do you remember why we celebrate it? Again, I made these multiple guests for you to make it easier, okay? D to remember loved ones who have died, to remember fallen soldiers, to remember presidents who have died, or to remember that the Packers are better than the Lions and the Bears, okay? Give you a second to wrestle with those choices. All right, and the answer, of course, is B, although I may start a petition on change.org to make it D, but the answer is B, is B um, to remember fallen soldiers. Actually, originally, Memorial Day was called Decoration Day, a day that you'd go out and decorate the graves of fallen soldiers. So there's a little piece of information for you to brag about tomorrow. Um, next question, uh, do you remember after which war we started celebrating it? Uh, the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, Civil War, or Star Wars? <laughs> Give you a second. Okay, make sure you're telling the correct answer to people next to you so you get credit for it. Okay, the answer is the Civil War. C, that is correct. Good job. Okay, do you remember when we started officially celebrating Memorial Day on the last Monday of the month of May? Okay, when did we officially start doing that? Okay. Um, the 1920s, the 1950s, the 1970s, or the 2020s? Now, if you say D, we've got a problem, but that's okay. The answer is C, the 1970s. It actually was 1971 that the government made the last Monday of May officially Memorial Day. Before that, it was like the 30th or something that landed on whatever day of the week. Okay, do you remember... At what staff position to fly the flag on Memorial Day? Okay. Is it full staff, half staff, three-quarter staff, or this is a trick question, Pastor Chuck? Okay, give you a second. The actual answer is D. This is a trick question, Pastor Chuck. The real answer is you start flying the flag at half staff, and then at noon you raise it to full staff. I don't know why, but that's the truth. You can look it up. You don't have to believe me. You can just look it up. But so for those of you flying your flags tomorrow, half staff at noon, raise it to full staff. That's how it works. Okay, last question. Do you remember in which war the most United States soldiers died? Was it A, the Civil War, B, World War II, C, World War I, D, the Vietnam War? Give you a second. The answer is A, the Civil War, which if you think about that makes sense because it was Americans fighting Americans. Um, but if you go back, go ahead and go back and put all four of those options on. That's, those are the four top wars that we've lost the most soldiers in that order. That's the order. Okay? This morning, we want to consider the power of profound memories. We want to consider the power of of profound memories. Our scripture reader for this morning is Leanne Swoboda. Leanne, go ahead and make your way on up to the podium. As she does, I'm going to ask all of you to please stand, if you are able, and face the center of the room. We uh, read from the center of the room as a reminder to us where scripture is to be in our lives, both as individuals and as a community of faith that should be central. And so, Leanne, whenever you're ready, please read from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Be sure to... Com Keep the commands of the Lord your God and the stipulations and decrees he has given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight, so that it may go well with you, and you may go in the, and take over the good land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Thrusting out all your enemies before you, as the Lord said. In the future, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with the, a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent signs and wonders, great and terrible, on Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. 
But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land he promised on oath to our ancestors. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God so that we might always prosper and be kept alive, as in the case today. And if we are careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. Leanne, very good. Thank you very much. You may be seated. I just want to begin this morning with the whole idea that faith in Jesus empowers us to move forward. Faith in Jesus empowers us to move forward with all the changes that have happened and are happening in our, in our country, in our culture, in our society. It is tempting to look back and wish for the good old days. And while it's important to remember the past, Faith is not desiring to go back to how life used to be. Faith isn't about desiring to go back. Faith is a moving forward exercise. The future is uncertain. The future has always been uncertain. Because, again, we, again, we never know what the future holds. But faith is deciding that Jesus can make our future better. It's deciding that Jesus can make our future better. You know, it's high school graduation season. And uh, sometimes I hear people refer to the high school years as the best years of their life or the best years of your life. Okay, that's just ridiculous. (laughs) That's ridiculous. Okay, Um, I don't know I don't know how kindly I can say this, but if the high school years were the best years of your life, uh, you've had a sad life. I'm sorry, okay? It just hasn't been that good for you then, all right? If we follow Jesus, we believe that the best years are in front of us. They're in front of us. Jesus said in John 10.10, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus wants our lives to be fulfilling. And so when we follow Jesus, how we do life is going to change. See, when we follow Jesus, how we treat our family is going to change. When we follow Jesus, how we treat our friends is going to change. How we treat our bosses or our employees is going to change. It's going to change how we treat our enemies. It's going to change how we treat those in need. All these things should always be changing, being shaped by our faith in Jesus. Our futures will be better if our faith in Jesus changes us. Faith in Jesus empowers us to move forward and live life better. But moving forward in faith requires remembering what the Lord has done. It requires remembering what the Lord has done. As we move forward, we remember God's faithfulness. As it said in the passage that Leanne just read, in the future, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws the Lord our God has commanded you, tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent signs and wonders, great and terrible, on Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land he promised on oath to our ancestors." So when their kids asked, why do we follow the decrees of the Lord, which of course assumed that the kids saw them following the decrees of the Lord, the answer was a story. It was a simple story, but it was a story. Here's one way, again, if you're thinking about telling a story to your kids, this particular story, here's one way you could tell that story to your kids. Go ahead. The Israelites were trapped. 
They were slaves in Egypt, slaves for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh made them work hard. Get to work, he said. All day they had to make bricks. Brick after brick after brick. So the Israelites cried out to God, God, please save us. God heard their cry and sent Moses. Moses went to Pharaoh and Moses said, God says, let my people go. But Pharaoh said, no. God sent plague after plague after plague till finally Pharaoh let the Israelites go. God's people, the Israelites, marched out of Egypt. Every man, woman and child, all following Moses. It was God who had saved the Israelites and it was God who led them out of Egypt. A cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God led them out of Egypt till they came to a sea. Meanwhile, back in Egypt, Pharaoh changed his mind. He cried out, what have I done? We have lost all our slaves. So Pharaoh prepared his chariot and Pharaoh prepared his army. Then Pharaoh charged off after the Israelites. He found them camped before the Red Sea. The Israelites looked up. There was Pharaoh with his army charging down on them. And the Israelites cried out, Why have you brought us out here to the desert to die? It would have been better to stay in Egypt. But God said, Do not be afraid. And that night God separated the Egyptians and the Israelites. He placed his cloud between them. And God told Moses to stretch out his staff over the sea. So Moses stretched out his staff over the sea. All night long, God sent a wind from the east to push the sea in half. All night long, God's wind blew and blew and blew till it dried up the seabed. And when the ground was dry, the Israelites marched through the sea. A wall of water on one side of them and a wall of water on the other side. The Israelites walked safely through the sea. The Egyptians saw the Israelites march into the sea, and so they chased them. But God confused the Egyptian army. He made the wheels fall off their chariots, and it was hard for them to drive. God told Moses to stretch out his staff again, and as soon as Moses stretched out his staff, the sea flowed back, and the sea swallowed up the Egyptian army. Not one Egyptian survived. God had saved the Israelites, and when the Israelites saw God's power, they both feared him and trusted him, and together they sang a song praising God for his amazing power that had saved them. Again, a very simple story, very simple answer to the question, why do we follow the decrees of the Lord again? That was the answer. Now, if I'm the child that asked that question, I may respond to that answer with, okay, so we follow the decrees and laws of God because he rescued us. He rescued us from someone who told us what to do. He would give us laws and he told us what to do. And so now this God is telling us what to do. So we exchanged one ruler who told us what to do for another one who's going to tell us what to do. What's so great about that? But you see, the story didn't start with the rescue. It started with slavery. It said, tell him, we were slaves to Pharaoh. Well, what what was that like? Well, there's two kinds of lawgivers in this story, and the first lawgiver was Pharaoh. And Pharaoh begins with assigning them slave masters, assigning the Israelites slave masters, and he oppresses them with forced labor. 
And the labor that they had to do, Scripture says, is they had to make bricks. Day after day after day, they had to make bricks. Now, a group of us last September, we did a Bible study tour in Egypt, Jordan, and Israel following the Exodus. It was a biblical study tour of the Exodus. And uh, they gave us an opportunity to make bricks similar to how the Israelites would have done it. And so I think we have a video of me making a brick, okay? You're going to see why I don't do hard labor because I'm not good at it. But go ahead and play that, play that video. I don't know if we're, we don't have to have the sound. I'll walk through it here. I think we, here we go. Okay. Man, my legs are really big on that screen. Okay, so what, what we're making what the brick with, it's a mixture of clay, straw, and a lot of dung. And so the water that I'm putting my hands in, the, the clay that I'm picking up right there, uh, it doesn't smell real good. And even that water I'm putting my hands in isn't real clean either. And so they, there's a frame that I'm going to put that clay, dung, straw material in. And I'm, it's in the shadow, so I'm not sure how well you can see it. But trust me, it turns out to be a pretty good brick, just so you know. Um, and again... What's interesting is they made them, again, you, oh, there you go, that's a better shot. You see all the bricks behind me there? There were, I don't know how many piles of bricks that size. I, I don't know, there are dozens of piles of bricks like that. And you, again, it would take, but you'll notice that making a brick, now I'm finished, it takes a little bit of time to make the bricks. That's probably enough. They don't need to see that. Okay, but imagine... Okay, now I have a nice hat on, I'm wearing shorts, a t-shirt, um, I'm in the shade. I doubt the Israelites, when they were making bricks, had that. That they were making those bricks in the hot sun. Brick after brick after brick after brick. Day after day after day. Week after week after week. Month after month after month. Year after year after year making bricks and bricks and bricks and bricks. And if that wasn't enough, Pharaoh orders that all Hebrew boys be killed, that newborn baby boys would be thrown into the Nile River. Baby boy after baby boy after baby boy. And then he orders that they would make the same number of bricks without supplying them with straw. And he calls them lazy. You see, the Israelites, through Moses, they came and requested for some time off to worship God. And Pharaoh's response to that request is he makes their work harder. And he calls them lazy. Lazy? These are people who literally slave away for this guy day after day after day after day. And his response is he calls them lazy. Now the Lord, see the Lord was concerned about their suffering. And he delivered them with great and terrible signs and wonders on Egypt. Now, the phrase great and terrible, that's kind of an interesting phrase to put together because either something's great or something's terrible. How can it be great and terrible? Well, it kind of depends on your point of view. If you're an Israelite, the signs and wonders were great. If you're an Egyptian, the signs and wonders were terrible. And then God, the Lord, gave them the promised land. The Lord is concerned about them. He does signs and wonders for them. He has a land for them. You see, Pharaoh was all about Pharaoh. God was all about the Israelites. Pharaoh's laws were for his benefit. The Lord's laws were for the Israelis' benefit or for our benefit. If you take a look at the Ten Commandments, many of you are at least somewhat familiar with them. Some of you are very familiar with them. I'm just going to give you a second to kind of review them, take a look at them. 
But these are the commandments that Moses came down Sinai with um, about 40 days after they crossed the Red Sea. Now, God's commands, the Ten Commandments and others of God's commands, they've become associated. It's not uncommon for us to associate them with legalism. Legalism being defined as following a set of rules to gain God's favor. At TFRC, we don't believe in legalism. We believe that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus. But that doesn't mean that we disregard how God instructs us to live. You see, we don't follow the commands to gain God's favor. We follow the commands because we have God's favor. Look again at these Ten Commandments. Who benefits from these commands? In Egypt, just to kind of go back a little bit, in Egypt, there were literally hundreds, if not thousands, of Egyptian gods that needed to be worshipped, that needed to be kept happy, that needed your attention. And God takes the Israelites out of Egypt and says, you only have to worship one. In Egypt, there was a place of slavery where they literally worked every day making bricks. They didn't get a weekend. And God comes and says, I command you to take a day off. It's not, hey, I'm going to let you have a day off. It's, I am commanding you, take a day off. If you're a slave in Egypt, and you've been a slave for years, how does that command sound? It's revolutionary. It's freeing. And we've taken the Sabbath, and we're like, oh, yeah, Sabbath, that's legalistic stuff. What? It's a gift. It's a gift. You need a day off. I am commanding you to take one. In Egypt, Pharaoh had the baby boys thrown into the Nile. And God says in his commands, no murder and honor parents. How would that sound? In Egypt, they would work every day, and yet they would still be called lazy. And God says, no false testimony. It was the Israelites who benefited from the commands. The commands were for them, and that's true to this day. They are for us. They benefit us. And so when we ask, why follow the commands? We remember what the Lord has done for us. What about Jesus? What did he do for us? As it says in Romans 5, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We need to remember that. See, if you're here today and you consider yourself a righteous person, remember that Christ died for you. If you're here today and you consider yourself a pretty good person, remember that Jesus died for you. If you're here today and you consider yourself an ungodly person, remember that Jesus died for you. And maybe even you're one of those people who likes to joke, well, man, if I ever enter into a church building, the church building might collapse, or maybe I'll get struck by lightning or something. Hey, look, if you're in that boat, Jesus died for you. And so while we don't live under the laws of Pharaoh in Egypt, there's a really good chance that we are slaves to other kinds of cruel laws that do not benefit us. The performance law, where your value is based upon what you can do. The achievement law, where your value is based upon what you can produce. The social law, where your value is based upon your social status. The financial law, where your value is based upon your income. 
What gives us value? What do we as a society value? You see, Jesus died for you because God is for you, not against you. And even if you don't measure up to God's standards or to any other standards that we impose on each other and on ourselves, God is still for you. And moving forward in faith requires remembering that, what the Lord has done, because following Jesus is hard. And so we move forward in faith because we remember what Jesus has done. And we remember that what he did, he did for us. So we can move forward in faith when we realize the Lord's commitment to us, when we realize the Lord's commitment to us. Going back to the passage where it says, be sure to keep the commands of the Lord your God and the stipulations and decrees he has given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight so that it may go well with you and you may go in and take over the good land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors thrusting out all your enemies before you, as the Lord said. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God so that we might always prosper and be kept alive, as is the case today. And if we are careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness our righteousness. Righteousness, to me, is one of those churchy words. It sort of sounds like some kind of super holy living or person. But there's a real simple definition to righteousness that I really like, and it may not be academically 100% complete, but I think it captures the essence of what righteousness is. And that is righteousness is simply living in right relationship. Righteousness is living in right relationship. So in a marriage, one form of righteousness is being faithful. Parents, one form of righteousness is taking care of your kids. Kids, one form of righteousness is listening to your parents. Employees, one form of righteousness is working hard Employers, one form of righteousness is paying a fair wage. The Bible, interestingly enough, talks about God's righteousness. And in Scripture, when it talks about God's righteousness, it's describing his saving acts on our behalf. God's righteousness in Scripture are his saving acts that he does on our behalf couple quick examples. 1 Samuel chapter 12. The Sa Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your ancestors up out of Egypt. Now then, stand here, because I am going to confront you with evidence before the Lord as to all the righteous acts performed by the Lord for you and your ancestors. What were those righteous acts? It was when he brought the ancestors out of Egypt. It's a saving act. Proverbs 103, 6 says, The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. So when the Lord works on behalf of the oppressed, that's his righteousness. When God works saving acts on our behalf, that the Bible describes as God's righteousness. Now, our righteousness is simply trusting God by following his ways. Trusting God by following his ways, which of course includes belief. But it just seems right that if God is for us and God saves us, for us to follow the one who saves us makes a lot of sense. That sounds like a right relationship to me. Now, TFRC stands for Twin Falls Reformed Church. And the reform piece is because we come out of something called the reform tradition. 
And the Reformed understanding of our relationship to God is boiled down to three words. They were able to boil it down to three words. Guilt, grace, gratitude. Guilt, grace, gratitude. We, we were guilty in our sin. God saved us by his grace. We didn't earn it. God just did it. And we respond in gratitude by following God's ways. Guilt, grace, gratitude describes our relationship to God. Another aspect to following is that in the passage, it says that they follow or we follow so that it may go well with you, so that we may always prosper, and so that we may be kept alive. You see, following the Lord's ways are the best ways to live. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Jesus' commands are the best way to live. You know, there's all sorts of principles for good living. If you want to be healthy, there's a great principle. Eat right and exercise. Not easy to do, but very simple. You want to be sound financially? Well, there's a principle. Don't spend more than you make. Easy to say, easy to understand, hard to do. You want to have a fulfilling life? Well, Jesus has something to say about that. He tells us, he teaches us to do things like to forgive, to love our enemies, to give to those in need, to be honest, to be humble. Very simple concepts that are hard to to do. But if we were just to take the opposite of what Jesus teaches, if we took one list of what Jesus teaches us and took another list of just take whatever the opposite of what Jesus teaches us, and we just compared and contrasted those two things, what would you see? Again, Jesus says, forgive. But we can always hold a grudge. Jesus says, love our enemies, but we can always seek revenge, you see. Jesus says, give to those in need, but it's really tempting to simply hoard for ourselves. Jesus says, be honest, yet how easy is it to lie, to cheat, to steal? Jesus says, to be humble but it's so much easier to be arrogant. You see, Jesus is committed to our well-being. Which list do you think is better for you? Not because it's right, not because you should, but which list will give you a full life versus which list will give you an empty one. To forgive, to love our enemies, to give to those in need, to be honest, to be humble, or to hold a grudge, to seek revenge, to hoard for ourselves, to lie, to cheat, to steal, to be arrogant. Jesus wants us to follow him so that we may have a fulfilled life life. Which command of Jesus do you need to follow for your own good? Which command do you need to follow? Do I need to follow? It's a great question to ask ourselves. Which command of Jesus do we need to follow for our own good? We need to remember 
We need to remember what God has done for us in the past. We need to remember that God is for us. He showed that when he sent Jesus to die for us on the cross. He showed that he is for us, not against us. And he is committed to giving us fulfilling lives, lives that he had in mind for us when he created us. And God is always at work in you and in me and all of us to lead us to what is best. And he never stops. He never stops. He's worked in our past. He's working in our present. And he will continue to work in our future to always lead us to what is best. And so we will move forward in faith in Jesus, even when what he calls us to do is hard and maybe even sometimes it seems impossible. But we know that he is always at work in us and he will never stop. So what is Jesus leading you to do differently in your life because of your faith in him? Which command do we need to follow for our own good?